My name is Toby Capwell, and I'm curator of arms and armor at the Wallace Collection. My relationship with arms and armor began as a child's fascination and grew over time to become my professional career. These are incredibly expressive objects. They exude strength, splendor, prestige, and power. They are ingenious artificial exoskeletons designed to make their human wearers almost invulnerable. They are both works of art and demonstrations of an advanced technology. I think that this duality of an expressive art object, which is also a complex piece of fighting equipment, is one of the most interesting things about armor. One of my earliest memories as a child is being utterly overwhelmed by the sight of a full equestrian armor. Images like this speak to something ancient, something primal in the human psyche. This is a creature which looks vaguely like a human being, but in so many ways he is more powerful, more godlike. And this power is not an illusion, it is real. With good armor, a Renaissance knight could endure terrible physical punishment that would kill an ordinary person. And because of his advanced combat training, learned from childhood, he became much more dangerous too. And through his mastery of horsemanship, he assumed superhuman strength and speed. It's not difficult to understand why such a sight is awesome in the true sense of the word. This is one of the most famous equestrian armors in the world. Certainly, it's a very important historical object dating from the 15th century, but I think a lot of its popular appeal stems from this dramatic pose. Unlike most modern museum displays of armor, this one has strong, dynamic body language, which we react to in a visceral way. It seems almost like it is alive. And that is something of how the artist armor who made it intended it to be seen. But there is also something missing. This is art which is supposed to have someone inside it. Building an armor was a process through which the artist transformed his patron into a living sculpture. So to really get armor, we need to better understand the people who wore it. For many years, I've looked at funerary monuments almost as much as I've looked at armor. From the 12th century onwards, members of the knightly class in Europe often had life-sized effigies made of themselves to mark their final resting places. These figures stood for who these people were in life, where they belonged in society, what their associations were, and indeed, what they looked like. Knightly effigies always showed their subjects as fully armed because armor was the single most important visual indication of a knight's identity. Therefore, this kind of monumental sculpture is another different art form which is vital to the study of armor. These extraordinary figures often provide us with crucial illustrations of types of armor which do not survive especially from the 12th, 13th, and 14th centuries. They also show it complete as originally worn, not just the metal elements, but also the perishable organic materials, textile, leather, bone, and horn, which have almost never lasted long enough to be preserved in places like the Wallace Collection. Finally, unlike the harnesses now on display in museums, these effigial armors are not empty. They show us the equipment as worn by its original owner. They reveal the person inside and help us to imagine the armor as animated and alive. As enchanting as a beautiful knightly tomb experienced in a medieval church can be, it's remarkable that certain very special armors still radiate a powerful sense of their lost owners. This is the most important armor in the Wallace collection, and it's also my favorite. It was made by one of the greatest armorers who ever lived, the master Kolmann Helmschmied, who worked in the city of Augsburg in southern Germany. 
Coman's career represents the absolute zenith of the armorer's art. His works are extraordinary hardened steel sculptures, which also represent the most advanced armor technology. Such armor was essential on the battlefield, protecting the wearer from swords, axes, arrows, crossbow bolts, and even gunfire to some extent. It also played a pivotal role in aristocratic courtly life, worn in tournaments, jousts, parades, and other formal ceremonies. This was as good as it ever got. We know who made this remarkable armor, and we know it has to have been created around 1527, but we don't actually know who it was made for. However, the wonderful thing about an armor like this is that if you look closely at it, and consider the stories behind it, many clues to the identity of the owner start to reveal themselves. The Wallace Collection Helmschmied armor is clearly a close relative of the, the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V's. That's because it was made by the same master armorer at the same time for, I believe, a member of the emperor's immediate family circle. The most likely candidate is Charles's younger brother, Ferdinand, who became king of Bohemia and Hungary in 1527. So this armor might have been made as a royal present given by the emperor to his little brother to mark the occasion of his royal investiture. In fact, Ferdinand may even have fought in this very armor at his coronation tournament at Prague. Ultimately, this is one of the most magical things about armor. When you stand next to one of these things, it feels as though you are standing in the presence of the person who wore it hundreds of years ago. The armor was made for them, fitted exactly to their particular body. It surrounded them and protected their body from harm. It augmented them. It is an extension of their person and their identity. In a way, it is them. So, Looking at armor feels stranger and more magical the more you know about it. It is a physical experience that transcends time.